Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, my partner in crime, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are doing a Zoom episode this week. We are very excited for uh, our featured guest. We are going to delve into a uh, a subject, a pocket of American organized crime that we really haven't addressed yet in our uh, several years of doing this show. We're going to talk about the Pittsburgh Mafia, um, the uh, La Roca crime family that uh, was written about by our guest, Paul Hodes, a former FBI analyst who worked in the Bureau for almost two decades and um, came out in the last couple weeks with uh, a great piece of literature to add to the the canon of, of uh, you know, very compelling organized crime reads. Uh, it's called Steel City Mafia. Uh, Blood Betrayal in Pittsburgh's Last Dawn. Paul, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Scott and Jimmy. It's great to be here. I, I actually love your show. I'm a fan. So, Well, we we appreciate you and, and your work. And I was so excited when you reached out to me, uh, I think about a year ago, to, to mm-hmm. talk about what you had in the hopper. And uh, no, no, disres- no disrespect to the era uh, of Pittsburgh organized crime where things were nice and stable and functional mm-hmm. <laughs> back in, in the, in the mid 20th century where, uh, you know, the golden era, but your book really focuses more on that last vestige of power and prestige that the Pittsburgh group had, uh, Mike Genovese, who was the godfather, who, who was Lo, uh, John LaRocca, the, the family namesakes protege and, uh, mm-hmm. Mike Genovese led a, you know, a, about a 20 year, tenure in the Pittsburgh mob and it, you know, as opposed to, you know, uh, an automobile going from zero to a hundred, his automobile went from a hundred to zero. Mm-hmm. There are kind of mm-hmm. a, a number of reasons for that, that you get into. Uh, and it's not yeah. just Pittsburgh. You really dive into a lot of Pennsylvania organized crime outside of the Pittsburgh uh, proper, but all families yes. or all factions that reported uh, to Pittsburgh. So you're talking about other other cities like Youngstown, uh, Altoona, um, mm-hmm. some other uh, you know strongholds um, yep. in the area. So Paul, thanks a lot for joining us, and just maybe uh, jump in right away and just tell us kind of what your inspiration for writing this book was. Sure, sure. Um, so my inspiration was uh, I grew up in a place called Johnstown, Pennsylvania, um, and. Uh, I lived there until basically like I was 21 years old and uh, moved away around like the early, early 2000s um, to New York City. And it was uh, it was a, a really cool place, honestly, uh, a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of uh, immigrant families that had come in, you know, in the, like the 1920s. Um, and it had a small organized crime presence. Um, that I was only marginally aware of when I was uh, like a kid, a teenager, reading about some of this stuff as the court cases came up. Um, and it was really those articles, like in the Pittsburgh Post Gazette and uh, and other papers, that got me into this topic. And then you know, things like The Sopranos came out, and uh, I, I became a quick fan of that in my young young years. And uh, it just stuck in my brain the whole time. And then I wrote a military history book a few years back and uh, on another topic I'm a fan of. And when I was thinking about my next topic, I was like, this is a no brainer. It's going to be the Pittsburgh Mafia. No one's written about it yet. It's actually a very exciting story. Um, and uh, it's it's worth telling. And it's it, it's also amazing because I don't think a lot of people who live in that area really understand how much was going on. They've kind of just there's like kind of a collective memory loss on that. Obviously, the people who are directly around it still think about it and talk about it online, especially. But but the general population, I'm trying to get get them back into it and say, hey, there's this really cool story that happened right in your backyard not that long ago. Um, you know, just the long and short of it. And, you know, we'll throw it to Jimmy if he has any questions to start. But when Jimmy and I were talking off air. You know, just to condense it into kind of like a bite-sized uh, 
knowledge base and then we'll unpack from there. Mm-hmm. It seemed like Mike Jenner days took over the family. And again, the family was pretty robust at that point in the early to mid eighties. Mm-hmm. And again, from a, from a kind of a neophyte when it comes to Pittsburgh, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself a, a Pittsburgh mafia expert. I, I definitely yeah. just like a lot of these subjects, I probably know more than the average human being, but I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but I, I think there, there were two pretty big decisions that led to the downfall of that crime family. And mm-hmm. one was to dive headfirst into the drug game. Um, a yeah. lot of families were, were uh, kind of dancing around it and neglecting to fully embrace it. Uh, and Pittsburgh was one of the first families to kind of throw out that, that that um that belief that there was a a die or a deal or die order it, it, whether some families kind of had it but it was more um more like you know uh, you know more 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 talk than actual action and then the second yeah. one would be the fact that Mike Genovese didn't really just didn't want to make a lot of people and and really became a ghost he was a, a mob boss in name but would really not have all would have would, would never do a lot of hands-on stuff had a lot of buffers and then didn't want to replenish the the um the rank and file yeah yeah and uh they they had kind of that replenishment problem with la Roca too um he uh, hadn't made uh people in a while and that was one of the reasons why mike genovese uh did uh when he when he first started he made uh five guys um in the first few years after he became the godfather um but and for pittsburgh that's a lot like that's like uh a, a, a quarter of the family basically you know i estimate that there are around 20 members in the 80s um and uh you know for for a small family like that that was a big deal but you're right like after the 1990 trial which we can get more into if you want it, it that scared him uh i think and in the, the opinion of the of especially the the main case agent that i've been talking to who's obviously now retired uh but it, the fbi agent he thought that mike genovese was basically after 1990 like i'm only going to do business through intermediaries for sure he already had that tendency um you know uh me and you had talked about uh, his meeting with uh, Nikki Scarfo in 1986, they had a a beef over uh, a bookmaker that was outside of Pittsburgh, who was uh, Scarfo's uh, uh, oh. brother-in-law. And basically, uh, uh, Pittsburgh was trying to tax him. And uh, he finally reached out to Scarfo for help because Pittsburgh was kept up in the percentage every time he said, you know, hold off, hold off. And it eventually got to 50%. And so Scarfo showed up for a meeting and Mike Genovese actually didn't go and meet him. He sent Chucky Porter, who very soon would be made and be an underboss. But at the time he was an associate. So, um, and, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I found, uh, after, after the book came out was a little bit more of a detailed report on that meeting. Um, and, uh, it, it doesn't seem like Nikki made his displeasure known at the at the meeting, but he, he basically just told him like, just go tell Mike what was said at the meeting in the morning, and they did. Um, the FBI followed Mike the next morning, or called Chucky Porter the next morning, um, his trusted associate at that time, and uh, they met at a hardware store parking lot, and I'm, I'm sure that's what they were talking about. They didn't record the meeting, but uh, but yeah, so he was extremely secretive, like I'd say probably one of the most secretive bosses I've ever come across in like mafia stories, uh, for sure. Um, you know, possibly to the point where it, it, it could hurt, you know, his control of things to a certain point, especially uh, later in the nineties. Um, and then the I, other I thing a, you mentioned, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just to pick up on that point. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, I don't want to lose my, uh, this question here that's so, that's that is very striking to me that in in the 80s genovese would not meet with scarfo personally because the 80s it's not now 
where basically mm-hmm. a lot of these dons are this is this seems like the norm these days yes. where people like Barney in New York I mean he, the guys in his own family don't even know who he is never even see the guy right maybe once a mm-hmm. year they see the guy <laughs> and it, and you know that's yeah. the norm these these days, maybe not like a guy like Tadaro or Skinny Joey guys who are very public, but a lot yeah. of these guys they're they're out of sight. But the 1980s to, to to not show up to a meeting with another boss, especially someone as temperamental as Nikki Nikki Scarfo, is yep. really remarkable to me. I mean, Scott, you're, Philly is one of your areas of expertise. I mean, I can't imagine Scarfo. I mean, did, did he? Was he? And I, well, I heard that I mean, story I'm first. Just, Probably they didn't want to kill him over that. Well, I heard that story firsthand, you know, because I wrote Mafia Prince. Uh, <laughs> hit the siren, Benny. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, that's Philly and Eddie's autobiography, Siren Again. Uh, but I remember having that conversation with Phil uh, probably the first day or two that I was interviewing him. And I didn't know anything about this particular circumstance. But I remember asking him what what type of relationship or communication were you and your uncle having with the Pittsburgh guys? And this was the first story that he, he, he told me. And yeah, um, right off the bat, when Phil started recounting the story, uh, he said that his uncle was, was offended. Uh, not that not only Mike Genovese didn't come meet him, but he sent like uh, Paul uh, referenced, he didn't send a made guy. Yeah. Chucky Porter would eventually become a made guy. Eventually became the underboss. And in a lot of ways, Paul referenced the 1990 trial and Chucky gets nailed with, with drugs and flips. And that really is, is kind of the beginning of the end for Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't, I, I could be wrong, but my memory is telling me that, that Phil told me at the time that they didn't even know who Chucky Porter was. So yeah. it wasn't like they were sending a guy that they had done business with in the past that had represented Genovese or La Roca. Uh, to them mm-hmm. in the past, but they were sending a guy that they didn't even know. Yeah, there were two that's, other that's guys. To me. Yeah, there are two other guys at the meeting that were made to like sort of assist him. But Chucky Porter was really the lead negotiator. Right. Um, but uh, it was Lou Volpe, who was an old, a real old timer. Um, he I think he was in his 70s at that point, at least. And then Joe Sika, who was also very old and who was actually uh, related to Al Arco from the Lucchese family. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and they Lou Volpe actually approached Scarfo uh, after the meeting and told him straight up that Mike wasn't going to come because there was a law enforcement presence uh, in the area, which was correct. And Leonetti, Leonetti actually spotted them and he said, hey, Chucky, is, are those who are those guys behind you sitting at the bar? They look like they're cops. And he was like, oh, yeah, those guys are those guys are law enforcement. Um, so. And and Mike Genovese, from what all I've seen, he he would have been completely anathema to having his picture taken with someone who was as high profile as Nicky Scarfo. It would have been like his worst nightmare. There are very few photos of him. There really are. It's hard to find anything of him from when he was actually the boss. Right. Um, like I a lot of the pictures that I have, as you saw in the book, they're kind of when he was younger. Um, there is one from 1984 that's a surveillance shot of him coming out of the holiday house, which was their headquarters at the time. Um, and you can kind of see that he's actually, you know, the age he was when he was almost the boss. Uh, but other than that, man, there's, there's really not a lot at all. What, what, let me ask you both. I mean, uh, what would be the, I mean, you talked to Phil about this, Scott or Paul from your research. I mean, was that was was some of the reaction not only to be put off, but like, who the fuck are these guys? Like, I mean, should we even take them seriously? I mean, would that have been is that too extreme a reaction, Scarfo, especially for a guy like Scarfo? Scarfo was offended that um, that the boss of Pittsburgh had the audacity to try to tax his his brother in law. Um, yeah. So it it was a situation where. Um, it, it was already getting off on a bad foot from before they even came yeah, to yeah. Pittsburgh to, to meet. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Paul, I mean, do you think or either one of you guys from your research, I mean, um, did, did Genovese have the sense of what a deadly individual he was, he was dealing with? Um, I mean, I, you know, I just wonder like, 
we know that Scarfo's reputation, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we know it now, but in real time, did he have a sense of he's, it? Just seems like a very flippant decision to me. I mean, Paul, can you I, speak to his? Was he aware of who he was dealing with? I think he was well aware. Um, there, there were. There are rumors I've heard from some people that I didn't put in the book because I'd never had corroboration, but that that basically that the family was meeting with other lower members, lower level members of Philly and other places. Uh, not necessarily Mike Genevieve's meeting with them, but other people too. Um, so they had contacts with them in that way, I think. You know, once again, I can't confirm that. Um, and then you also have uh uh, the papers. I mean, like Scarfo was already famous by the time this meeting occurred. So all he had to do was just read about him. He was all, all over the place like, pace for, uh, you know, some of the, some of the wild murders that had already happened. And I think he had already been on trial in New Jersey for that one. Yeah. This was the end of the Scarfo. This was the Scarfo's last year, 86 into 87. He was off the streets by spring of 87. So, okay. um, and, and I, I mean, I, I want to point I, I, out. Uh, Go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, I was just going to say. Um, sorry to belabor this point, but it's just so striking to me. He, I mean, he ordered he whacked people in Philly for a lot less of an infraction than this. I mean, is is it imaginable? Mm-hmm. Either one of you guys that Scarfo would have gone after someone in another Borgata, or is that even too 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 much of a leap for a guy yeah, like him? He, I don't think he would have put a hit on him, but I definitely think when for the for the last let's say year of, of Scarfo's reign if he was meeting with any guys in New York or meeting with any other family members he would he would you know uh besmirch <laughs> the way Mike Genovese runs his I family see. and the and the kind of proper protocol proper etiquette that he didn't feel like uh he, he received yeah and and uh and and to answer the second part of your question and I never saw anything about um, him possibly talking about him, but I could definitely see that uh, with other bosses. Um, uh, So for, for Mike Genovese, I think it was just, it was just secrecy purposes. Like I I have an FBI file that says that he would get enraged uh, when family business would be in the paper. Um, Like he would just stop talking to people for a few days and, and like just basically like, be alone uh for a while um he re- he really did not like it at all i mean he's was, very isolated i mean yeah yeah and 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 in the end it worked out for him but uh i'm sure it made business very hard to do like he was able to make aggressive moves i mean the joseph nastico tax issue came up because he was he expanded the tax on bookmakers in the in the in the pittsburgh uh mafia's territory Nastico, um, Nastico was was um, Scarfo's brother-in-law. Scarfo's brother-in-law, mm-hmm. yes, yes, and uh, and so that that was caused by his new policy, where he thought Larocco was too basically too nice to everyone, and he said, you know, everybody's going to start paying what they owe finally, um, and 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 that's it, which was something that Philly was doing at the same time too, and uh, and L.A. as well actually. Uh, Peter Milano was trying to do that too. So yeah, I want I want to point out and that's a great way to segue. So for for Jimmy's knowledge, um, who I don't think has read the book yet, but um, I'm going to get him a copy of it. Cool. And um, it's my fault that he he hasn't read it beforehand because I was supposed to get him a copy and and uh, we just haven't met up. But um, one of to me the best parts of this book is learning that the situation with. Scarfo and and Genovese wasn't an outlier. Mm -hmm. Um, There was another scenario that I didn't know about. I don't know if anybody knew about until this book, uh, where in the winter of 1995, which is nine years after the the meeting with with Scarfo and Leonetti, um, Peter Milano, who at that time was the boss of the Los Angeles crime family, Mm -hmm. uh, came to town. And Genovese didn't meet with him. He sent two guys, uh, two of his lieutenants to meet with him. And this was uh, revolving around Pittsburgh requesting permission from Milano to come into town and along with the Chicago mafia uh, have a a piece of a um, 
Indian reservation for shakedown and gambling purposes. The whole thing blew up pretty quickly. But mm-hmm. uh, there you have photos in here of uh, of the meeting where Pete Milano came um, to to Pennsylvania. Uh, or yeah. were they in Ohio? They were in Ohio, actually. Yeah. Uh, they, they were in Ohio, but that they were meeting. Uh, he he came to their neck of the woods to have yes. that meeting. Yeah, and and he came for other reasons too. I think he stayed for more than a few days. Uh, so Peter Milano traveled to the Cleveland area uh, in order to it was visit blood relatives, is what it said. Uh, yeah, because he has his family. Uh, his his father was the conciliary of of Cleveland for like thirty forty years. Yeah, and it, so he had deep ties and uh, reestablished contact with like the remnants of the Cleveland family at that time. And then also to meet with Pittsburgh about, uh, so they were investing in a casino that the the Rincon Band of Luiseno Indians uh, were uh, opening, um, a, a, a casino that had actually um, been part of a takeover scheme in the late '80s by the Chicago Mafia family. Um, and then they went looking for investors again, and, and the Pittsburgh family came in. Um, so they didn't really have good luck with that, but. Uh, uh, San Diego is, is where that, uh, casino is located in, in the same region. I think it's like 40 miles away. Um, and it's, you know, kind of in the, kind of in the desert, desert area. Um, you know, nothing could be farther from Pittsburgh, you know, without leaving the United States really. Um, but it was a good way to launder money, um, and to obviously make legit income too on top of it. Um, and then, you know, they had card games and, uh, one arm bandits and uh, bingo, bingo. I think there was a big bingo hall involved. Bingo hall, yeah, it, yeah. There was uh, the the real money maker was the mach- were the machines, the game, the machines. But um, you know, unfortunately for them, those those didn't last too long. Um, the the government, you know, figured that out and took the machines out. And basically, what was left was uh, the card games and the and the bingo, but Z- uh, uh, which wasn't as the, lucrative. The Pittsburgh guy that was. Running point was uh, Henry Zebo Zatola, right? Yes, yeah, he was the point man, and at that time in the nineties, I would call him basically the street boss of the Pittsburgh family. Mike Genovese, throughout his whole reign, always had somebody who was kind of point on the street. Um, so uh, at that time, it was Zotola, and uh, and he was he was a really smart guy, um, and he was actually in in the meeting with Milano, along with Lenny Strollo from Youngstown. Um, and then, uh, Youngstown area. Um, and then, uh, you had John Bozzano Jr. Who was the son of one of the early prohibition bosses. Um, and, and like, like, uh, Scott said, uh, Genevieve didn't go to that meeting. Um, obviously it was surveilled again. Um, I think, uh, probably a little more low key than that first one was. It's, so would we say this. that Genovese is, even though he's violating protocol, and I and I find that like kind of interesting, especially by 1980 standards, could we say that maybe Genovese was actually the smartest guy in the room here because they actually were under surveillance in all of these cases? And he died. Maybe he died. He died a free man. He's offending people, yeah. Even if he's offending people, maybe he was. Maybe he was ahead of the curve. He died a free man and and died a very wealthy man. Yeah, exactly. Like and and you know. Nobody really knows how much money he had. Um, his last wife in an article claimed that they didn't really have much at all. But, you know, he could have. I, I heard that he invested it in. in I don't believe that's true. For, for my for my research. And I've, yeah. I've talked to a lot of the top Detroit guys. Um, and I didn't realize. The the deep ties between LaRocca mm-hmm. Genovese and Zerilli and Toco until I interviewed Tony Zerilli. Um, mm-hmm. If you're gonna trust what I was hearing, uh, he he, it, it might not have all been on paper, uh, just to yeah. see in front of you, but but he 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 had quite a large investment portfolio, kind of like Jack Toko did, and I know that, um, at least again, what I was told is that he he had access to a lot of money, um, by the time that uh, the the nineties and two thousands had hit. Yeah, I don't doubt it, but I'm just telling you what the family said. But right. I I don't doubt it. Like there are. Uh, there's room in all over the place about investment, investing in real estate in Pittsburgh and uh, overseas bank accounts and, um, you know, hiding, hiding money around, you know, just in, in different places. 
um, which wouldn't surprise me at all. And, and, and just to get to back to Jimmy's point too, like he, he really was the smartest guy in the room. I mean, uh, he managed to weather, uh, what the eighties and the nineties, which were probably the toughest decades for the mafia ever. Um, and, uh, without going to prison and really he only spent, you know, besides, you know, like maybe like a day sit in jail when he was young or something like that, uh, for, you know, uh, small time crimes back when he was just an associate or even before then. Um, he really only spent like six months in jail in the mid seventies when he wouldn't testify before a, a grand jury that granted him immunity. Um, and that was kind of just a, you know, it was a tactic to push him to testify basically, which didn't work. Uh, but at that time, and I say this in the book, he promised uh, his associate said that he promised himself that he would never go to prison again. So he did make that come true. Um. Can I ask you about um, the uh, maybe it's not fair if, if you if you didn't interview him like his social psychology, but um, it sounds like he didn't want to make m- many more members eventually because for in- he wanted to be insulated. But like that's a reoccurring theme this episode. Um, so do you think he viewed it more as like, this is just a criminal organization that he happens to be running and not as concerned with like the legacy of like, you know, this is our thing. This is Cosa Nostra. Like this, this has to continue on and sustain. This is bigger than us. It sounds like he just viewed it as like, Hey, if this thing runs its course, (laughs) then, you know, whatever, at least I stayed out of jail. So I don't know for sure. Like you said, we did, we n- nobody's ever interviewed him, and he never would have talked anyway. But the uh, uh, the sense I get from putting everything together and seeing everything is that he he had to have given up on it because otherwise he would have made some people. You know, I, there there's some uh, you know some people who say like, well, maybe there just were no recruits. I don't think that's true. I think there were associates who wanted to be made. Um, there were a ton of people that probably deserved to be made who had done, uh, you know, made a lot of money, um, potentially, uh, you know, committed murders and things like that. Uh, so there were certainly a group of people that could have replenished the family. I think he made the conscious decision not to replenish it. And I was told by, um, you know, once again, my best source, who is the the case agent for the Pittsburgh family for from like the late seventies until the early two thousands, that that he believes that once uh, the trial happened, the nineteen ninety trial that took down his underboss and other top people, and the uh, the when that making ceremony was caught on tape in nineteen eighty nine in Boston, uh, the the or the Patriarca family, maybe not Boston itself, but that that family. It was Medford, but out right outside of Boston. Okay. Um, so after that happened, that 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 also freaked him out, and and he was like, uh, you know, like we got we got to stay away from that kind of thing. Um, and you know, it it seemed like at that t- time and in that year for Pittsburgh and for other mob families, like the world was falling apart. And uh, and I think he in- entrenched even more after that, and decided in essence like. This thing is going to die. Well, let's let's talk about that case, because I think that you can yeah. kind of draw a through line between one of the reasons the family fell apart. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, this decision to kind of go all in uh, on the on the burgeoning drug market of the late 70s, 80s. Um, and I also want to connect it to a, a piece of, of, of pop culture that people probably would recognize if you're, if you're fans of the movie Goodfellas mm-hmm. um, at the end of that movie, there's a constant reference to our Coke connection in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And that was, that was real. The Henry Hill and the Lucchese crime family were hooked up um, with the, the Pittsburgh mafia in doing their Coke deals. Guys that just like you saw in the movie, Henry Hill met in prison. Um, and these were guys that reported to tell me if I'm wrong, Chucky Porter. Yes. Yes. So uh, tell, tell us about who Chucky Porter was and how he be kind of, or not kind of became uh, Genovese's mm-hmm. 
not only his underboss, but the guy that was running all the drugs. Yep. And so uh, Chucky Porter is definitely one of the most interesting characters in the Pittsburgh family. And to me, in the mafia generally, uh, because he's kind of a he's kind of a like an, an oddity in, in many ways. So he's his name is Porter, obviously, which is uh, like an Irish English name. Um, he claimed that he was part Irish and part Italian. He claimed he was more Italian, like 75 percent Italian. Um, that's according to him. I dug into him a bit, um, you know, like on ancestry and whatnot. Um, and I can only really confirm like 50%, um, on his mother's side, um, I, for the book's purposes, I put in what he said, which was 75. Um, so he was at least 50%, possibly 75% Italian. Um, but he had that non-Italian last name. Um, he, uh, started out, uh, kind of as a leg breaker, um, bodyguard for the Manorino group in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, which was a, a branch of the Pittsburgh family um, led by Gabriel Kelly Manorino, who is a legendary figure um, who died in 1980. Um, he was the underboss for a long time. Um, and he had a lot of power and a lot of, uh, a lot of influence. So that was a good friend to have for Chucky Porter. Um, Manorino trusted him quite a bit. Um, there was a, a dispute, um, within the family, uh, that resulted in, uh, the murder of basically one of their hitmen leg breakers, um, who happened to be a friend of the Manorino group. And, uh, Chucky allegedly, it was never proven in court, uh, took vengeance on the person who killed him. Um, and that got him further, uh, further up the ranks in the family, you know, more respect. Um, he ran gambling clubs. Uh, he did all the, the standard things, loan sharking. Um, uh, and, but the thing that made him a little different than a lot of the made guys is that he did direct deal on drugs for a long time. Um, and he had associates underneath him too, uh, that were doing the same thing. And, you know, he was taking a cut of it, uh, before he was under boss and, and while he was too, um, and some people say that the reason that they got into drugs is that, uh, is that maybe the gambling business was a little down because you know that that area went through sort of like an ec economic decline in the seventies and eighties, uh, and it maybe maybe not as many blue collar workers were gambling. Um, uh, I I tend to think that it was just you know there was there was a coke craze in the eighties and and there was more money to be made so they and I think it. I, Again, tell me if I'm wrong. I think it hit Pittsburgh particularly hard. Um, it, it, it hit every major city hard. But I just recall, and, and, and this is purely anecdotal, but mm -hmm. um, I know that the Major League Baseball had a huge Coke scandal that a lot of it was based out of Pennsylvania, um, uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. I know that that locker room in the uh and again this is more probably more of a statement on what was going on in professional sports but i know in the <laughs> locker room of the steelers when they were at the end of their run with terry bradshaw uh winning those super bowls and then the the pirates in that 1979 uh we are family group a lot of cocaine a lot of cocaine um a lot yeah of and i i had heard that uh, yeah uh, uh, in uh, various forms of uh, trouble but because of of cocaine yeah, that's that sports connection. I'd I'd uh, heard about that too. I didn't get to put put anything about that in the book, but uh, but yeah, it was definitely it was definitely part of the Pittsburgh uh, party culture too, just like it was in a lot of other places. Definitely. Um, so Porter Porter went all in on that. Um, him and a few other guys, um, prominently among them, uh, Eugene Nick the Blage as well, eh? um, and. Uh, uh, Joey Rosa, who was a third generation uh, mafia associate. Um, his grandfather was made. His father was made. He never got to become made because of what happened uh, in the late 80s. Right. What's that? Wasn't he killed? No, he wasn't killed. He was he actually just he became a government witness. Um, OK, who am I thinking of? Who was the hit man uh, that was involved in the Youngstown Pittsburgh or sorry, the, the Pittsburgh Cleveland war out of Youngstown. Ah. Uh, 
Yeah, little Joey Naples. Little okay. I'm I'm sorry, I was confused. Yeah. Yeah, Go he ahead. he he was a force unto himself. Um so so Chucky Porter, um, everybody knew what he was doing. Um, and La Rocca allegedly didn't really want to get into drugs, neither did Manorino. Um, but they let him earn, they l- let him do what he wanted. Um, La Rocca still started bringing him around, despite the fact that I'm sure that they had to have known that he was in- involved in the drug trade. There's no way you couldn't. Um, and uh, he started appearing at La Rocca's Allegheny Car Wash, which was his headquarters in Pittsburgh, um, and having lunch with the boss and, and showing up in suits. You know, suddenly he became respectable in the late 70s. He started just showing up there. Um, and clearly La Rocca liked him. Um, and, uh, when LaRocca died and Mike Genovese took over, he relied on him very heavily, um, to be kind of his, you know, underboss, but also the street boss, you know, the person who's actually resolving some of those lower level disputes. And, uh, and Chucky was still in the drug trade and Mike was accepting that money. Um, there are people who are in the know, and I, I believe what they're saying that said that Mike was saying, uh, you know, I can't believe that Chucky was dealing uh, um, after after he was arrested. Like, um, you know, I'm I'm against drugs. I'm against all that. Um, I I think that for him not to know, he was a very smart person, in my opinion. For him not to know that is ridiculous. I think that he was probably just saying that. Um, that's just my opinion, but but that's what I think. Um, I mean, the same there, here in Detroit with Jack Toko, and not to always make it a Detroit thing, but you know, Jack was taking. <laughs> a lot of drug money um, mm-hmm. from, from multiple people, including, you know, his top advisor, Jimmy Quasarano. And, you know, he would tell everyone that uh, he, he was against drugs and that he didn't mm-hmm. want anybody in the family dealing drugs, but it was all, it was all lip service. It, none yeah. of it was, it was all like, you know, in theory, but not in practice. Yep. Yep. And, and that's the thing too. Like I mentioned Nick the Blade Wale. He was close to the hierarchy too. He was close to La Rocca and Genovese. Um, had had worked for them in the past, um, and he was super obvious about it. I mean, you know, like very like flashy. He, he was the drug drug dealer par excellence in that area. And uh, and as you mentioned, he's he's under Porter, um, but he's also the Pittsburgh connection. Really, um, his underling associate is Paul Matze. And uh, and or Matsai, uh, some of these names, I'm unsure of the exact pronunciation, but he uh, was uh, Henry Hill's direct connect, this Paul Matsai guy. Um, so that's where he was getting his drugs from. But Paul Matsai was getting it from Jezuale, who was getting it from Florida. And then, you know, you trace it back and it goes to Columbia. Yep. Um, and so Paul was also uh, the guy that hooked up Henry Hill with uh, the point shaving scheme with yes. Boston College. Yes. Paul, Paul knew uh, a couple guys that knew a player on that team. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they, they made a lot of money, I think, in the 78 season. Uh, yeah. 77, 78 season shaving points. Yeah. And I, I think the player was actually from Western PA. If I'm not right. Mistaken. He was. He was a Pittsburgh guy. Rick, I think it was Rick Kuhn. Yeah. Yeah. That's the name. Um, and And those – those guys, uh, you know, and I think just while even commented on it at one point, like I saw an article where, you know, he was like, they shouldn't have made a movie about uh, that rat Henry Hill. They should have made a movie about a real gangster like me. <laughs> um, but he was really super flamboyant. Um, he had uh, his like monogram, like his initials on his underwear and his shirts and pants and all this stuff. Flashy cars, uh, penthouse apartment. Um, he, he had a Rolls Royce that the government didn't uh, confiscate and his sister kept it for him. So, so there's a pretty cool picture of him yeah. with a, sitting in front of a 1980s Rolls Royce down in right, Florida after right he, when he got out. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, he, uh, they had a, a mole in the FBI office, actually a clerk, a secretary who was on the FBI's organized crime squad there. Um, and she was giving them uh, a bunch of very important documents about Porter and et cetera, and all all, all the people who were involved in that drug enterprise. Um, so just while he was actually tipped off uh, before the indictments came down, he ran to Jamaica and he was able to hide for a year, but eventually the U.S. Marshals caught up with him. Um, 
and uh part of it was they they uh they knew that he couldn't stay away from betting and drug dealing and so um he was doing both down there um uh and 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 the the locals arrested him and handed him over and that was the end of the pittsburgh connection i i have a question that just the, the elephant in the room here as the theoretical criminologist um it's just Chucky Porter. I mean, if his dad's not Italian, he shouldn't even have been made. I mean, that just that that's just a that's an axiom of Cosa Nostra that just I mean, and I know they talk about oh, the Rizzuto's maybe made a guy who wasn't Italian. Well, they mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, you can I guess any family can say whatever they want and make someone, but they will not be recognized by another Cosa Nostra family. And um it just it just I mean that's astounding to me. I mean, he, he should not have been made if his Italian, if his dad wasn't Italian. And, and you're exactly correct with how the rules are f- like, you know, in a perfect situation, but for Pittsburgh, and this was Al Diarco said this, um, he said, that's just how they did things down there. Basically that if they found somebody who was talented, they would either treat him like they were made, you know, even though they were an associate or, in Chucky Porter's case, he actually got made and then became part of the administration. And he, you know, was supposedly uh, the uh, the liaison to other families, too. So he was meeting with other people. Um, and uh, and it's like you said, <laughs> I don't know if they were happy about it in, sometimes, but it's who they had to deal with. Right, right. Well, and, and, and Jimmy, yeah, as we know. There's, there's, there, but there's guys in Detroit who are, who are who are not Italian who for all intent and purpose were treated like made guys but being treated mm-hmm. like a made guy and being a made guy are two different yeah. are two different things so you get blinded, really you get blinded by the envelopes you know as long as the envelopes fat um they're not going to see <laughs> your, your your true ethnic bloodline they're going to see what they mm-hmm. want to see and i know the first thing that comes to my mind i know there's a lot is, of is debate. there anything is there anything sacred anymore <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, like I said, one thing that, that I immediately gravitate to when we talk about this conversation, and I've heard both sides of the fence on this, but, you know, Sonny Campos um, mm-hmm. over in uh, um, with, the, with, the, with the Gambino crime family, mm-hmm. and I got people that are swearing to me he's Puerto Rican. I have other people telling me he's Italian. Nonetheless, he's been a huge earner um, mm-hmm. over the years and is a capo now, and I would guess... Uh, he's, I think he's in prison. He's going to come out in a couple of years. I, I would guess that he's on track to become an, a future member of the administration. He's not that old. He's in his fifties. Uh, um, but you know, whether or not he's Puerto Rican or half Puerto Rican or half Italian, Sonny, <laughs> Sonny Campos, you know, the envelopes did the speaking for him. Just like I think in this case with you know, 30 years earlier with Chucky Porter. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, there's one other example I can think of, and since it's your area of expertise, Scott, I, um, uh, John Vesey. Yeah, v- nobody really knows. I mean, I think Vesey was Italian, um, mm-hmm. had Italian blood in him, but he definitely was a was a, a mutt and a wild card and not someone mm-hmm. that would have ever gotten their button uh, under any normal circumstances. You know, yeah. if, if we're just going to brainstorm, I know two guys that became bosses that weren't full blooded italians jimmy marcello uh, in chicago mm-hmm. uh is either a half or a quarter irish frank salemi who became the boss of uh the patriarchas in new england was half irish um but Gotti jr wasn't full italian right but in but all those cases mm-hmm. to jimmy's point in all those cases their dads were mm-hmm. yeah yeah um so i i i think uh i want to just ask you about nick the blade i mean me mm-hmm. and jimmy knew or me and jimmy are or the, the show itself is is friendly with seth ferrante who's who's one of our guys and um seth when he was locked up was mm-hmm. very close to to nick the blade and i remember um learning about nick the blade from seth on the mm-hmm. phone and nick the blade sitting next is like next to seth <laughs> um and you know trying to tell me that Hey, you remember the the um the the Goodfellas Pittsburgh connection? Well, that was me, and I had never heard of him before, because <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I wasn't a Pittsburgh expert. 
Yeah, and yeah. Quickly, I found out that because at first I remember Seth telling me this, and I was like, "Jizz Wally." I was like, "That sounds like an Indian name." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought Seth was being fed a line of bullshit. Yeah, Obviously, yeah, yeah. I did my due diligence, and Nick the Blade was a was a force to be reckoned with in yeah. Pittsburgh. He got out. He was free for about two years, and then died a strange death uh, in the last decade. Um, he like choked to death. Yeah, it was it was 2016, and I don't think it was choking. I th- actually think it was his heart gave out. Okay, he was drinking wine at something that was called the Pastimes Bar. It was in Ormond Beach, Florida, and uh, and like I guess he used to do that all the time. Like that was his hangout, and he was drinking, and uh, he just fell over and like died and have had a heart attack basically. Yeah, like in the middle of a restaurant. Yeah, yeah, and and like it was kind of appropriate. Like that was. That was where, he, like, I think in his younger days, especially, like, where you could find him was clubs and bars. Let's let's jump back and and um, talk about Youngstown for for a little bit, and then we'll end with uh, the current state or the post Genovese years. But sure, um, sure. with Youngstown, it's always been a absolutely riveting, uh, fascinating mob landscape. Uh, you know, for me to study, and um, it's close. It's relatively close to Michigan, where we are here, and mm-hmm. it's, it's it's this kind of no man's well, not no man's land, but it's kind of this very working class town, and it's not just the town; it's the county, it's the Mahoney Valley, um, and it was at one point in time was very lucrative uh, organized crime territory, and it was always shared by Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And you had two sets of, or two different wars, basically. One mm-hmm. in the 60s and then one in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, how much did, did that story within a story uh, play a role in your research? Uh, a big role because the Youngstown crew, as I call them, and there sometimes there are multiple crews there, like you mentioned. Um they were super important. Um, Youngstown itself was uh, had to be one of the most mobbed up places in America uh, from the you know from the early days of of the of the of the mob world to the nineteen late nineteen nineties. Um, and you know when you think about that, you know it's it's a place where you know you're talking about tens of thousands of people living in the city. You know, maybe at its height, you know, a hundred thousand or so. But like, it for a place that's that small to have so many, um, you know, there's always a small amount of made guys in town. Like, not not that many you could count them on one hand. But the amount of associates and and people who really probably would have been made if they were like in the New York area or something like that. Like, you know, being made in Pittsburgh and and in Cleveland too was kind of like a gift that was very rarely given. And Pittsburgh um, won that war. I mean, at the end yes. of the the end of the run of the Youngstown Mafia, which pretty much ended 20 years ago, it mm-hmm. was the Pittsburgh guys that were the last ones standing. Cleveland yes. had been kind of wiped off the map in, in the early 80s, and uh, Pittsburgh controlled that area into about 2000. Yep, yep. And then in, in the 60s, it was a bunch of car bombs, like over 80 car bombings. Um Many that were like message jobs, not nobody died, but but some that people did, including uh, innocence. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Cad- Cadillac Charlie, that was what yeah. kind of started the whole thing. Yeah, uh, and his kid got killed. It's like ten year old, twelve year old kid. Yeah, um, was killed, killed in that car bombing, and his other kid was injured. Right, um, and uh, you know, horrible stuff. And then when you get to the late seventies, early eighties, and that that second war. Um, between Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Uh, the 1960s one was a little more muddled, I'll say. Like, there were some independent operators in there, possibly even some other families like Buffalo involved, back in people. Um, and then you have the 70s and 80s one. It's it's much more uh, concrete who's going up against each other. Um, and they've stopped using car bombs on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, you've got people shooting each other in the street. Um, you know, and the body count eventually got up to nine, ten people. One of the hits probably was just an inside job for uh, for uh, the uh, Pittsburgh family, um, just whacking a guy who was uh, skimming a little too much off the top. But 
the other people, including uh, a civilian who was killed, uh, the father of one of the hitmen. Um, you know, when you're talking about that amount of bodies and two small families like that, you know, I, if I'm not mistaken, that was the same body count that you had in the Colombo family war. It, so it's pretty crazy. Um, and Cleveland could ill afford it because they they had had a war with Danny Green, who was an Irish gangster in the mid 70s. So they and that's what really started the war is that uh, the Danny Green war weakened Cleveland. Pittsburgh saw an opportunity and said, all right, we're going to we're going to start moving in on some of these rackets in Youngstown, Mahoning Valley. And and they did. Um, and Cleveland fought back pretty hard. A lot of Pittsburgh guys died. Um, but in the end, Pittsburgh did did win. Um, you know, they they were in control of all the politicians there in control of all the gambling and to give you just a taste of what kind of money was coming out of there. Casino, which at the time was the largest illegal casino um, that law enforcement had you know, been able to discover. Uh, and it was making reportedly 20 million a year um, in a small place like that. So that's, that's like a, a ton of money for there. So, um, and you know, the people who came out on top were, uh, Jimmy Prado, who was kind of uh, the leader. Um, I, I, I hesitate to call him. People call him a capo sometimes. I don't think he officially was. He was a made guy. Um, and then uh, his two protégés who became made right at the end of his life, Len- Lenny Strollo and uh, little Joey Naples, as you mentioned before. And then those two, once Jimmy Prado dies, those two kind of have a power struggle. Yeah, uh, so... They didn't really like each other. Um, uh, little Joey Naples was very infamous around the area. Lenny Strollo kind of stayed in the shadows. Um, and uh, there was definitely some animosity. Lenny got pinched from the All-American Casino bust. He went to jail for a little less than a year and a half. And uh, uh, that was around 1990. Um, and then in he was very worried. Uh, reportedly that uh naples was going to take over his rackets and you know kind of muscle in on on what he had left and uh and lo and behold in august of 1991 naples is inspecting this new house he's having built and uh a sniper from a cornfield uses what what they what they think was a rifle and uh shoots him dead and uh, really, it's the only killing of a made guy in recent Pittsburgh history. You know, you'd have to go way back to the to the old days to get another made guy who was murdered. A lot, a lot of associates were killed, but made guy is very rare to, for that to happen. And this is the subject of endless debate in Youngstown. There's a right. whether there's or a not Facebook. Lenny knew about it or did somebody yes. do it on Lenny's behalf without Lenny knowing about it. I've, I've been, I've been inundated with both sides of it over the years. Yes. And, and there's, there's more than a few theories. Um, and, and like there's a Youngstown mob Facebook page that uh, has really helped me out. I've been talking to a lot of people on there, some of whom were former mafia associates. Um, and it's endlessly debated on that page. And like, you've got, uh, You've got people who think that Lenny did it, and that's the easiest answer. You've got people that think that there was this independent operator, who I'm not going to name because he's still alive, um, who was trying to impress him and and shot him. Um, and then there's another theory that the Pittsburgh hierarchy was thought he was too flashy and um, and that there was some kind of uh, involvement in a drug enterprise, and that after the 1990 trial, you know, they were thought he was a risk. Um, and Honestly, there's not a lot of evidence for any of those theories. It's not enough to that's why nobody's been indicted for it because it's just not it's there's there's no there there right now. Whoever did it did it very well. This is really striking uh historically too, because um shameless self-promotion, but by the time our audience sees this video or listens to it, they will have already had access to our episode with Michael Francis from last week. And he mentioned that most mafia wars are internal like the last time there was a big mafia war between families you have to go back to the 1930s and 1920s when mm-hmm. that happened mm-hmm. like usually big wars are internal so to have two families uh you know in different states go to war yeah. it's it's really fascinating i mean that just is not the norm at all so it's so intriguing and so interesting and it was a very odd war i mean it was very they kept it localized like during the whole conflict the guys were would come 
like uh, Kelly Manorina, who I mentioned, who's the underboss, and uh, Angela Leonardo, who was the underboss for Cleveland, and then the acting boss once Jack Licavoli went away. Uh, they met with each other and with LaRocca too, um, and uh, and they were talking to each other about, you know, like like basically like some of the problems that they were having with the the Cleveland leadership, the local Cleveland leadership in Youngstown and trying to hash things out and, you know, trying to get permission to kill this person and that person. And it, it's almost, it's, it's just a very odd thing. Each of their proxies are fighting it out. And, but yet they're still meeting at restaurants or, or at somebody's house and talking to each other. It's just, they didn't let it get out of control, which is kind of amazing. To, to draw another through line, uh, Lenny Strollo, who I've, I got to know quite a bit about because when he eventually flipped, um, mm -hmm. I think it was 98. Yes. He gave a lot of information on Detroit. Um, and, and a lot of my uh, FBI files that I've gotten that come from the early 2000s, a lot of that information is coming from Strollo. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually know more about this little pocket of of uh, the Pittsburgh La Cosa Nostra than I do the the entire um, orbit, but with mm -hmm. Lenny Strollo, he it, it's this through line I, I find as I'm it's crystallizing in my head. He was involved in the hit that ended that last war where Pittsburgh is able to defeat Cleveland. And it's mm -hmm. and I think part of what you were just talking about, these meetings between the bosses of both families and being upset with what was going on there and it ends up with one of the Carabia brothers uh, disappears. Yes. I believe it was Charlie Crab. Yes. Uh, the, the, the Charlie the Crab, Ronnie the Crab and Orly the Crab, uh, the Carabia brothers who were the Cleveland uh, crew bosses uh, for what was going on in Youngstown mm -hmm. and Lenny Strollo was able to make his bones by, according to FBI records, and I believe yep. that, I believe Lenny's own Lenny's own debriefing. Yeah, yes, um, I think he admitted to it. He lured um, Charlie the Crab to his murder in 1980. He he made the phone call uh, and told Charlie the Crab he had to be somewhere, uh, and nobody ever saw Charlie the Crab again. Yeah, and then you go, you know, 10, 15 years later. And it's Lenny Strollo's just off the reservation behavior that was so counterintuitive. You want to talk about the opposite of Mike Genovese mm -hmm, is Lenny mm -hmm. Strollo. Jimmy, you know, you, you have a, a guy that's not even a boss. You know, he's a, I guess you could say he was a captain, but I don't know if yeah. that would be accurate. Like, and, like the, the power he had was a ca of a captain, right. but and, not officially. And not only is he, depending on who you talk to, not only is he turning on his own guys, he's trying to hit prosecutors and sheriffs. And, you know, it was just totally out of hand. Uh, so it was like, he's part of what ends the, the this, this kind of these back-to-back -back wars that gives the whole territory to Pittsburgh. Within a decade mm -hmm. from that, or in about a decade from that, he takes over the whole territory. And then a yeah. decade after that, it, it all blows up because mm -hmm. he, he was a lunatic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then one other thing I want to just throw out there and then just have you guys, you know, mash it up mm -hmm. is that part of his blueprint for controlling that area in the nineties was again, drugs and, but more so going into black neighborhoods and recruiting African-American lieutenants of his and one guy that he had with him for a while this jeff riddle um he thought he was going around telling everyone that he was going to become the first african-american ever made into the mafia that lenny yes. strollo and mike genovese were going to make it <laughs> why not yeah, he did. why not if chucky porter can be the underboss <laughs> an irish guy can be the underboss why not <laughs> yeah and and uh i have like there's conflicting sources on jeff riddle so like some say that he was joking when he said that and others say, no, he was dead serious. And so, like, I tend to believe the dead serious side. Um, and, and, I, and I think that part of that is because he, he actually stuck to Omerta, you know, when the trial happened and his yeah. boss was testifying against him. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, 
he's he just he did so much for them that he probably expected to get some kind of reward for that. Um, you know, uh, being involved in in for, enforcing for them and uh, making a lot of money from gambling, et cetera, for them. Um, and also uh, what you were talking about. Yeah. Like even though Strollo wasn't necessarily directly involved in dealing drugs, a lot of his associates were. And, you know, they purposely, you know, what I talked about with that erosion of the blue collar gambling base, like the blue collar guys who used to work at the steel mills that shut down, um, they replaced that with. So there was a guy who's, whose name was Bernie the Jew Altshuler, who was actually Strollo's real lieutenant. Um, um, and then kind of Altshuler's man on the street was Jeff Riddle. Uh, he was kind of, uh, Bernie Altshuler was the connection to, uh, the the black criminals uh, and and the drug dealers who were in Youngstown who were the only people in town that had money anymore so they l- were trying to lure them into these games of chance and it worked like they all, all the drug dealers were gambling at the Pittsburgh mafia's uh gambling places and uh betting with them so so they were making money off of it um and then and then they started to get involved in this uh, fixing cases for the same customers, these gambling customers who are also drug dealers. Um, you know, so they're paying off prosecutors pretty exorbitant amounts um, while also taking a cut for themselves. So if you get in trouble as a drug dealer and you have this connection to the local mob, uh, you can say, hey, can you help me fix this case? You give them, you know, a set amount of money uh, of money. Um, it, it, at least in the tens of thousands of dollars, but a hundred thousand dollars on some of these cases. And, uh, you know, the mob guys whack it up amongst each other. And then part of it goes to the prosecutor. Um, and people are getting away with all these different crimes because, uh, Lenny Strollo is helping them fix cases. Um, and, uh, they really did own that Valley, the Mahoning Valley. They really did own it until Strollo flipped. Um, and the reason, the federal government did that is because, uh, you know, you, you think like, why would you make, why would you take testimony from the guy who is actually running all this? Um, is they were able to get convictions on like 70 public officials because of him. So yeah. they were able to basically just in one fail swoop, just destroy it all. And Youngstown was eliminated. I'm not saying there's no gambling there at all, even right now, but the big, the big players were all finished. I think one of the most true statements ever set on a wire, and I'm guessing, Paul, you've heard this. I don't know if Jimmy has, but um, at the end of all of that drama, when Lenny Strollo had testified against uh, everybody and had gone into witness protection and Bernie Altschuler, excuse me, Bernie Mm Altschuler and Jeff Riddle and uh, who were his number one Jewish lieutenant and number one African-American lieutenant kept their mouth shut, didn't make any deals, went to prison and adhered to an Omerita that they had never taken. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy on a wire that was heard. This is, this is what it's come to in the year 2000 that the mob capo flips and the Jew and the black keep their mouth shut. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It wasn't as poetic as that. Yeah, yeah, it was not poetic as that. But uh, I, I think it was incredibly. (laughs) um, It was an enlightening statement, and I thought I think it was very uh, hit the nail on the head for what the mob had become in the the early part of the 21st century, Mm -hmm. where you had the government make a deal with the mob boss to take down the underlings that weren't Italian, and and those those not Italian underlings kept their mouth shut and did their time. Yeah. And, and even Jeff Riddle said the same thing, actually, like during his statement, like, you you know, you have a final statement for your sentencing or, or whatever it was, or uh, maybe it was before he was convicted. I can't remember exactly, but he basically said like, you know, what kind of joke is this? Like, basically we're not even Italian, you know, like how, how, how can, how can we be convicted of this basically? Um, You're you're the big fish and the big Italian mob boss, but neither of us are Italian. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yeah, let me, let and, me and ask then, you, um, or go ahead, finish. Yeah, I was but just, let me just, else, just uh, end with this and then throw it to Jimmy. You look at those three, those three main characters in that drama. Jeff Riddle dies in prison. Bernie mm-hmm. Altshuler dies in prison. Mm-hmm. Lenny Strollo 
died a free man last year or the year before. It was 2021. Yeah. yeah. Like the summer. Um, yeah, he and he stuck around Ohio. Like right, he stayed you know. in Youngstown. He was yeah. he was staying uh spending his days at a, a tailor, like a men's clothier and be in the uh, in the back of uh, the store uh, telling war stories. Yeah, he definitely wasn't hiding. Sorry, Jimmy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I well, I, I have a question for Paul, but just a comment that I, I have an issue, uh, you know, with the criminal justice system. It reminds me of a parallel with Messino. When, yeah, I was when say. you give a deal with the boss to go after the lo- the lower ranking guys, I, it just seems ass backwards to me. It's not, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't I mean, agree with I, it. I, I, just, I don't agree with it. Yeah, something doesn't sit right with me. Not to say that those two guys were good guys and they mm-hmm. and they didn't deserve to go to prison for what they did, but yeah. just there's something out of whack with with, they, <laughs> with the top guy did. cooperates and the other other guys go to prison for him. They did try to kill a prosecutor, but. I should say that well, they actually successfully shot him. He just they didn't hit they didn't hit him in a vital organ, so he lived. But uh, but the the what you're saying, I understand. Like the only thing that I'll say that's different between Strollo and Messino is for Strollo, they had that like that desire to take down all these public officials who were helping them out, who otherwise they probably couldn't have gotten. Um, for Messino. I, and I don't know how many convictions he, they've gotten from his testimony itself, but but he, he I, I don't I don't know if you know they wanted the head on the wall. Seventy convictions afterwards. They wanted the head on the wall. They wanted to say we flipped the most powerful Godfather in New York. Who they got in terms of convictions from that? I think that was secondary. I mean, I guess Vinny Bachiano. But yeah, he wore yeah. a wire on, yeah, on Vinny. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I, there's another. I, I, Go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, go ahead. Finish. Sorry, Scott. Finish up because I, I wanted to ask I another gonna, thing about Genevieve. So, so finish. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think with Strollo, another alluring factor for the government in 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 making that deal with Strollo as a uh, compared to Messino, Strollo could give them information on more than one family. Strollo gave them information mm-hmm. on Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago. Um, and and other groups, in addition to the um, the corruption yeah. in, you know, in the in the uh, uh, in the government. And I suppose you could say the same thing about Messino too. I'm sure you knew. I don't, about know, but I don't know how much more. I I don't know if you could. I'm not saying that he wasn't having or that he didn't have contact with with mm-hmm. um, families outside of New York. But I don't know how much. I mean, I think he yeah, could have told yeah. you about. I think with the, Messino, the been- other five families. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It'd be the other, it'd be the other five fam, the other four families. They Messino would have intel on. I'm assuming. Yeah, but um, I, I wanted to well, ask Paul uh, about, about Mike Genovese. Is he? Is he, he? I mean, I don't know. I haven't read your book yet. I'm going to get it. I look forward to reading it. Um, and um, is Mike Genovese related to Vito Genovese? I mean, I have to ask. Excuse my so, excuse my ignorance. Uh, so. Uh... I have talked to people who have researched his genealogy and and I did a little bit too. Um, And he is from the same area just outside Naples. It's called Rocha Rhinola. Um, But there's no obvious connection from what I've been told. And uh, uh, this is uh, someone that someone I mentioned uh, me and Scott know part Jimmy, Jimmy B. Um, told me this um but it's not until like possibly like way back in 1800 so like if they are related it's very distant um there are some articles that say they're brothers and that's mis- mistaking there's actually Vito had a, a Mike Genovese as his brother who was you know in the New York Genovese family um and uh so the answer the short answer is no i think but like i i think there there might be some distant distant family like I think, you know, it hel- I think third cousin I think regardless of the the validity I think it definitely helped him I mean people you know heard that Mike Genovese was an up and comer in Pittsburgh back in the day and they I'm am I'm, I'm almost certain they assumed oh he's got to be related to Vito so he's got to have some bona fides Yeah they're probably not going Brandy. to to mess right. with him uh and there's a little bit extra there to be like, uh oh, don't don't touch that guy. And so, just to finish up here, 
you know, Mike Genovese died, I think, in 06. Yeah, 2006. Um, there really wasn't much of an organization left. I know there was a couple mm-hmm. guys that were stragglers. Um, Sonny uh, Sudi died in the last year. He was kind of the last made guy in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, what? what how, how do you write the obit for this family? So the obit is um, so you know you know the title of my book is the end the end of the subtitle is Pittsburgh's Last Dawn. Pittsburgh's Last Dawn for me is Mike Genovese mm-hmm. because he uh, commanded a, a, you know more than a few made guys had a lot of associates went through all that drama that we were just talking about. Um, and I, I I think you know he he obviously deserves that title. He was elected by the Capos. Um, after his death, um, there were only a very few made guys left, and even those guys that were left didn't have long to live, um, except for Sonny Chien, Chienchetti, like you said. Um, and he did, and, and this is why I don't discount families, even 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 if they only have one made guy. Like he was definitely he was, he was doing things. Um, you know, there's hints here and there that you can pick out it, you know, there's, there are definitely still associates doing gambling, possibly, you know, possibly giving him a cut of that. Um, and there were, there's this FBI document that was just floating around the internet, um, from 2017, somebody FOIA'd it. And, uh, it was, basically details these two associates trying to get this city work contract scam going. And in code, they refer to somebody named Doc. Um, and uh, the FBI doc mentions at the at the bottom of the paragraph that uh, they believe that Doc refers to, uh, you know, Sonny Chin- Chinchuti and that he's the head of the LCN in Pittsburgh. And so that's a pretty late reference to be called the head. Now, the reason I don't call him the last Don, even if he was recognized as that by the associates, is because <laughs> he was the only made guy. So, <laughs> so he was kind of a, a family of one. So, uh, so there was stuff going on still, and 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 that uh, some of the people in Youngstown that I've been talking to uh, said that uh, Sonny still had a lot of respect in Youngstown, like among the remaining associates there too, uh, but. But I don't I don't think it was anything like it was before. Um, you know, there there's there are families that are on life support. And I would definitely designate Pittsburgh as that um, post 2006. Why don't you think Sonny decided to do what Mike Genovese didn't do? And, you know, he was whatever, however you want to categorize him. I mean, he had mm-hmm. in theory, he would have had the opportunity to try to get that family uh, back up and running, make some new guys, restructure it. But he seemed to take the same approach as some of these older, other old timers is, you know, as long as I stay out of prison and as long as I make money and no need to, to, to rock the boat. Yeah. I mean, that's the only thing I can figure is that he didn't want to rock the boat still. I mean, that he was a good student of Mike Genovese and, uh, you know, the, one of the other last members, John Bazzano Jr. Um, who may have been the interim boss in between uh, Genovese and uh, Chin Cuddy. And, with, um, with and so we talked about it. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead, Paul. Paul. Um, no, I'm just saying like the, I think these guys all had that same mindset. That's the only thing I can, that's the only thing I can imagine. You know, I know a lot of people online um, like to talk about how, well, we don't know what if they made secret members and they're, they're still there. Yeah, we, we, we can't I suppose see. there's like a 1% chance of that, but. Like I, I would think that we would, there would be something coming out of it, right? Like, like if you're active, you're going to be committing crimes, and you're going to sometimes you're going to get caught. And I, I just want to mention it as we're closing closing up here that Sonny was not a guy that was like a, um, you know, because of attrition, he was the last man standing. I mean, yes, because of attrition, he was the last man standing, mm-hmm. but. I want to be very clear to people that Sonny was not a uh, Sonny was a guy that had a lot of respect as, as Paul mentioned, and the respect dated all the way back uh, 50, 60 years. Um, You know, he was well liked by John LaRocca and Mike Genovese. And and I know me and Paul were talking a a couple months ago. I had, I found a newspaper reference. I, I couldn't, 
refined it, but I had one time I had found a newspaper reference in New York, um, I believe from a, a court case in the early 70s that referenced an FBI report that said Sonny had driven the Pittsburgh leaders to a commission meeting. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this, this was back in the 60s when he would have been a guy probably in his 30s or 20s. So yeah. this was a guy that did have the bona fides that you would have needed to resurrect a crime family, kind of, you know, if you want to make a comparison of what's going on in Buffalo right now. Um, but mm -hmm. for whatever reason, uh, you know, Big Joe Todaro had that inclination, according to the FBI, if you believe them, and, mm -hmm. and Sonny, for whatever reason, did it. And I think to maybe to Jimmy's point and throw it over to Jimmy, jo, you know, Joe Todaro has a family legacy to be concerned about. You know, the, his family dates back in, in the Buffalo crime family decades and decades. Sonny doesn't have that kind of that, that bloodline. Um, urgency or or uh maybe um what's what uh, jimmy how how would you how would you phrase that well like the kinship like the well just it, it, it's more of a family business for the Tudaros, and for sunny it was a, a organization that he was a part of like in detroit yeah, yeah. The Tocos, it's like you know it's there it's right. like if you have a restaurant that's been around for a hundred years it's your restaurant you didn't just work there your name was yeah on the, yeah it's a tradition you know that i it's just kind of interesting. I think the sociology and psychology of um, the, the the leadership in some of these families that are dying out or are or are just actually defunct. Um, what what they see, their role and their legacy in terms of continuing that tradition. Do, do they view themselves as just gangsters as part of an, and they happen to be heading up a, a criminal enterprise and stay out of prison? Or if that means we don't bring any new people into it, because we want to minimize our our you know exposure then so be it or do do they see it as something like uh you know my my dad was a mafioso my grandfather's a mafioso my uncles my cousins and this is this is a tradition that we have some kind of obligation to to continue on now you know i think there's going to be some people out there would say oh you're being naive all these guys are just gangsters they don't give a shit I think that's probably true for for a lot of them, if not most of them. But I suspect that for some of them, uh, some of them do think about, especially these families, that this has been part of their tradition for multiple generations, that some of them might think about it as more than just a, a criminal enterprise. Yeah, and I think the Pittsburgh guys did. But I think that, like, and this is, once again, just my opinion, a, a, lot, a lot of this uh, – sort of more recent stuff is that way because um, law enforcement wasn't chasing them as heavily during this time period because they weren't, you know, they were small and they were not the biggest crime threat in Pittsburgh. That's for sure. Um, you know, after the nineties, it, it, they were, uh, they were less than viable. Uh, but the, uh, the, I, I think that they, they made that decision this is my theory. They made that decision and they decided to let it die out. But while they were alive, they were still true to it. You know, they were they were doing business, even if on a much lower level than they were in the 80s and 90s and uh, and 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 still still controlling things. And the associates, you know, there's they're presumably still paying up even until the end, uh, you know, just out of respect. I mean, are they really afraid of a of a of a man in his 80s? Uh, you know, I, I doubt it. But they they still have that respect. They still have that, uh, that tradition. So in that way, I think they still, they still adhere to it, but it just, the continuing survival of the organization just wasn't, was not priority anymore. Um, I think they realized, um, something that the other families will eventually realize, which is that, you know, this thing is going to die out unless you get new blood, you know, unless you, make it into an organization that maybe is made up of, you know, actual Italians or Sicilians like it originally was, you know, back in the day. It's, it's interesting to compare and contrast the two different parts of Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I know that Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, you, if you don't know, you think, oh, they're both in Pennsylvania, but they, they're very far apart. Mm -hmm. And growing up in Philadelphia is a lot different than growing up in, in Pittsburgh. But you have one side of the state where it's 2023 and the Philadelphia crime family is 
in some ways thriving. I mean, at least numbers wise, they have more numbers mm-hmm. on the street now than they've had since the eighties. I think there's something like 45 made guys right now that we know of. And, mm-hmm. and I'm hearing that they've been making ceremony. There could be over well over, you know, uh, 50 guys, uh, maybe 60 yeah. guys in, in, in um, Philadelphia in the 2020s. But, you know, Pittsburgh is, is um, no longer. So it's, it's, it's interesting mm-hmm. to, to look at that, uh, you know, from a, from a, uh, a perspective, from a, a 30,000 foot view of the state of Pennsylvania. And then, you know, the Scranton Wilkes bar uh, Buffalino family is, you know, is, is gone too. Yeah. And they were dead. I'd say like, what was that by the, by the late nineties, early two thousands as well. Like, you know, basically Billy DeElio is running around being a mafia diplomat for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and he he's was, got a, a, he's got a family of one. Out. Yeah. He's got a book coming out and he did an interview uh, for a, um, a Fox special that I'm a part of. Um, so it should be interesting. I don't know it, if I'm it, supposed to say that. I, I laugh about, <laughs> I laugh about Scranton because I, I, Keep on going back to uh, Phil Leotardo. Uh, that's a glorified crew. <laughs> it's definitely a glorified crew. <laughs> Even at his peak. I thought it was, wasn't it Carmine yeah. Patazzi that said the glorified crew comment? Yeah, well, he, he said, he said Carmine one. used to always say. Oh, right, yeah, right yeah, there, yeah. glorified crew. This <laughs> yeah. was great, Paul. We went, well, this is maybe our longest episode we've ever done with a guest. So no, you can tell fun. how enthralled Jimmy and I were. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, I can't Paul, wait to read your book. I, I'm, I'm really this. I mean, I, I'm I admit I'm ignorant. I didn't realize that like, Pittsburgh was had this much, <laughs> this much going on. It's really intriguing to me. I can't wait to dig into the book. So uh, I'm going to show it on the screen right now. Um, go get it. This is a great read. I read it in a weekend. Um, I am thoroughly impressed by the photos. Um, just amazing. Never before seen. Um, surveillance photos of all the guys that are mentioned in this book. Um, just a great compliment or, or companion to the to the text, which is which is uh, outstanding, well researched, very thorough. Uh, and, you know, you know, no stone no stone is left unturned. And like like we said at the beginning when we started talking about you writing this, there's there isn't really a you know a book of record to to be able to go to and say okay this is this is the bible when it comes to pittsburgh let's say 1965 to 2005 but now mm-hmm. we got it paul you did an amazing job thank you so much thank you guys so much it was it was great to be on here i i loved it where can guy where can people uh, pick it up is there anything else you want to promote so i uh, you can go to your favorite online retailers it's it's all there if you live in uh the the western pa ohio like sort of uh west virginia area um the publisher is going to stock stores in that area so uh my uh relatives have been sending me photos of it in bookstores so that's that's encouraging um but uh Ar- the arcadia publishing website uh amazon barnes and noble it's it's there great well thank you paul uh we definitely want to have you back on uh, with any new projects you got, or just to come and chop up uh, mafia history, you're you're incredibly well versed, and um, I, oh, we could have you back on just to talk about your your work as a uh, for 18 years as an analyst at the FBI office. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, thank it, you so much, Bill. You go ahead, Paul. It was very interesting, guys. Thank you so much. We owe we owe people like you a debt, and uh, we'll be back next week uh, breaking down more uh american mafia canadian mafia drug dealers bikers we we uh we touch on it all here at the original gangsters podcast uh we love bringing you this content so please like uh subscribe share um we're only growing and 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 we're only going to keep growing and and paul thank you so much we will see you next week for jimmy bucciolato scott bernstein og podcast out